Good afternoon, everybody. Um, hello and welcome to our final lecture uh, of the uh, lecture season, our final Boscombe Down Branch lecture. My name is Jack Chamberlain. I'm the Member Secretary for the Boscombe Down Branch, and uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you tonight to uh, Defence and Security in Difficult Times by Sir Brian Burridge, who, prior to his appointment as the Chief Executive of the Royal Aeronautical Society, uh, had a career which included 10 years with Leonardo, uh, a global high-tech manufacturer in the aerospace, defence and technology sectors. During that time, he chaired the Innovation Hub of the Defence Growth Partnership. And prior to that, he spent a full career as a pilot in the Royal Air Force, holding a frontline command at every level in the service, including the National Joint Command uh, in the 2003 Iraq War. He also spent several years in the UK Ministry of Defence, in policy posts, and left the RF in 2006 as Commander-in-Chief Strike Command. So Brian read physics and electronic engineering at Manchester University and holds an MBA from the Open University and two honorary doctorates. Previously a research fellow at King College London, he's now a visiting professor at the University of Reading. So uh, we thank him very much uh, for being able to give up his time tonight and uh, give his presentation on uh, defence and security uh, in difficult times. So, so Brian, thank you very much for uh, joining us this evening and we look forward to your talk. Thank you. So good evening everybody and uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk to you. Um, let me start though tonight with um, the recognition of um, a sad bereavement, sad for the royal family, sad too for the society. His Royal Highness the Prince Philip was passionate about aviation, I have to say to the advantage of us all. He got his wings in 1953 he flew 59 types and amongst them some interesting ones that will probably have had a connection with um, certainly with the Royal Air Force and probably with uh, what was then uh, the Royal Aircraft establishments. He um, flew in the right hand seat of a Vulcan and um, took control for several minutes. He uh, was in the co-pilot seat for a series of Canberra blind landing trials which I guess was at Bedford, that was in 1959. He flew the BAC-111 uh, in 1966, which I think probably was one of the um, uh, Royal Aircraft Establishment 111s. Uh, as far as the society was concerned, he um, was awarded an honorary fellowship, and that's the photograph on the top left um, in uh, 1954, and that's uh, Sir Sidney Cam presenting it to him. Uh, the middle there, um, indicates his time um, as honorary president in 1966 um, and he actually chaired the annual general meeting of the society in uh, May 1966 uh, and he was a really active president in that um, he attended uh, a number of events and also the centenary congress because that was the society's centenary year and also the fifth ICAS Congress. ICAS is the international body of aerospace engineering uh, from a research point of view. And uh, he delivered the, um, the keynote address on influences on the development of aviation. And uh, there he is with Sir Frank Whittle um, celebrating at another dinner in 1987 to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the first running of the world's jet, world's first jet engine. And at bottom right, I imagine you recognize that, that's the officer's mess at Boscombe Down, and if memory serves, that's towards the end of 1970. So a, um, a greatly encouraging figure to whom we owe a lot. Um, let me start with a warning as I talk about defence and security in a difficult time. The language here uh, gives it away, but that was John Maynard Keynes in, um, on the 14th of August 1945. And he wrote a paper called Our Overseas Financial Prospects, which was essentially a blueprint and a comprehensive analysis of Britain's future grand strategic situation. Um, but in a sense, uh, he had a blank sheet of paper in as much as you would in a nation recovering from war with all the economic strictures that represents and the need to reformulate your place in the world. And um, he, if um, 
if the rhetoric is to be believed that we've heard from our government over the past year or so, then um, we too were expected to start from a blank sheet of paper. Um, there is a similarity, of course, that uh, collectively between 1945 and now, our ability to fund a grandiose defence and security strategy is limited. 1945, um, particularly hard year, recovering the economy from war, and yet here we are in 2021 with a £2.13 trillion pound debt, uh, which is 97.5% of our gross domestic product, and that's higher than it's ever been. But here's hoping that interest rates stay low. So we've heard much about this blank sheet of paper, and uh, in these, um, these documents, there was endless speculation, as inevitably there is, as the uh, integrated review in, and its three siblings, indeed, were uh, always going to be published next month. Uh, ultimately, uh, it took until um, only a couple of weeks ago for them to be published. 400 pages in all, and um, interestingly, uh, there was more media interest before their publication than afterwards. You'll remember you could hardly move for um, angst over the number of regiments and battalions there might be, um, the matter of armour for the army in terms of future tanks, future uh, armoured vehicles, etc. But uh, once it was published, that seemed to subside. And it was absolutely striking that the Sunday afterwards, in the Sunday papers, which would normally go to town on this, was virtually no mention at all, uh, whether that's an indication of the times of COVID or a genuine disinterest is hard to tell. Um, what I'm going to do, though, is merge the themes out of those four documents rather than go through them individually. Uh, but we also have to respect the fact we don't actually have a blank sheet of paper at all uh, in that our, our strategic profile um, is fairly heavily set in that we're still a member of the Permanent Five of the Security Council, we're still a nuclear weapons state, we still have dependent territories and we still regard NATO as the cornerstone of our defence. So hardly a blank sheet of paper. But whilst it's um, perhaps a stable era in terms of those pillars, it's an intensely unstable period in terms of what we're facing by way of the threat. This comes out of uh, the, um, the review and I think it's quite a good uh, representation of the ecosystem as it is now of the threats that face us, both in terms of hard capability and soft capability. And it's true in history, uh, certainly in post-war history, that it's always been difficult to gain public consensus over where and how this nation should be defended against a threat, the threat, as determined by successive governments. But a threat texture like this makes that even more difficult. Now, in many ways, it's very hard for people to conceptualise what this means in the face of what a diverse terrorist threat and the voyage of discovery into the grey zone. And we'll talk about those at some length. Yet, classically, our defence and our armed forces represent a lever of national power alongside diplomacy and economics. And of late, um, most doctrinal approaches will include information. And that may be, if you like, the first glimmer of the grey zone. But that defines us both as a nation, both to ourselves and externally. And looking backwards, internationally, the notions of burden sharing, consensus, interoperability, were all things that were readily understood across Western allies. And their approaches towards collective defence were generally carefully calibrated to avoid creating discord. And there was near certainty about the way to proceed. Now, of course, there's no certainty. Looking at that ecosystem, there can be no certainty. And the cohesion of allies is actually less prominent as you see this balance changing between international interests and national interests. And that, in a sense, has led to the rules-based international order 
being under threat and that has significant implications for what we're going to talk about. It's interesting um, to look at how we see ourselves and this is out of the integrated review and you'll see that um, in a sense there's a kind of throttling back on the military instrument. I think previously we may have had sort of Premier League armed forces or something in there, uh, but, but there isn't quite that. The accent is much more on soft power. And you see at the top of the right hand page um, where we are allegedly ranked third in terms of soft power. And it shows a perhaps message that the government want to portray of here is a potential science superpower, something that Boris Johnson said in one of his very first speeches when he took over as Prime Minister. So ranked fourth in the Global Innovation Index, second highest number of Nobel Prize winners, and uh, this sense that um, in the new technologies like cyber, you know, this country uh, knows where it's headed. And it is uh, certainly in tune with the new threat, cyber being one of them, but it pays uh, particular attention to the importance of intelligence agencies. And unsurprisingly, with COP26 coming up in November in Glasgow, the climate change conference, climate change gets a significant mention. And, you know, one of our uh, pieces of national strategy at the moment is to leverage that for uh, every possible way we can. But when you look at uh, any um, defence review, strategic defence review as they are commonly called, then there are sort of four questions um, that uh, most people need uh, to ensure are satisfactorily answered. And you have to look quite hard for the evidence for these things. First of all, is there actually a strategic focus on our defence and security posture. And um, that comes from many a criticism where governments have said uh, both types, this is a strategy led review when actually it's financially led. It's um, impossible to separate the two incidentally because um, clearly the way in which the national um, treasury is divided up has implications for strategy right across the piece. Um, the second is this business of stability of intent and, and this has been one of the shortcomings uh, over the last two decades or so in that um, the stability of intent over the delivery of the strategy that is um, expounded has been very limited. Some of it because it was politically incoherent. In other words, it represented more political interests than national interest. Some of it because it was undermined by um, the uh, necessary finances. And I was personally involved in the 1998 Strategic Defence Review and uh, it was a beautiful piece of strategy work but when it came to costing, we didn't have the um, rather more elegant instruments at our disposal that we have today. We completely got the costing wrong. And actually, as a bit of um, slightly unfair, but we got um, uh, a completely different view of how we would score efficiencies than did the Treasury. But at the end of the day, they call the shots. And we were actually 800 million pounds a year short in being able to fund that defence review. And that was a, um, a, a, a friction, a tail that dragged us back over the next decade. And so the necessary finance has to be there, both from the point of view of its stability and indeed the stability of wishing to achieve the objectives that were set out. A little bit different now because hitherto we're saying we have a, a defence review every five years. Well, um, I can tell you the 2015 defence review wasn't very special and, uh, and the way that it um, uh, did not balance strategic appetite with resources available. And then the last, uh, so that's the affordability thing as well, but then the last thing is, well, okay, that's fine, but are there enough of the right people to make it happen? And that's something that we'll want to just pay attention to as we go through my remarks this evening, because um, 
highly skilled people of the right capability in the right numbers in an advanced economy is really quite a difficult equation to solve. So they're the quick key questions we want to look at. And um, just as we um, do that, we probably uh, need to consider our agenda. Um, so what I'll do is look at the geopolitical shifts that come out of those four documents. I particularly want to dwell on science, technology and operational sovereignty because that I imagine is of major interest to you uh, here at Boscombe Down. I'll uh, run through combat air and space capability and ISR capability in the sense of, well, that's the orbit. Um, and then there's some interesting stuff on uh, industrial strategy. And all of this is set against four overarching trends. The geopolitical and geoeconomic shifts point towards the importance of both the Indo-Pacific region and the growth of China's influence. Secondly, there is systemic competition between states based on values. And we are seeing that being unwrapped in the last decade in a way that I think we would have, um, if we'd gone back to the beginning of the previous decade where George Bush Senior was talking about the new world order, then we would have been uh, surprised. We would not have predicted the way in which um, systemic competition has arisen. Thirdly, huge and rapid changes in technology, uh, which in self inspires um, intense global competition. And those of you who've heard me talk about the much vaunted fourth industrial revolution will know that I recognize uh, that the technology involved is much more accessible globally than say in the third and second industrial revolutions. So it's hardly surprising that this rapid technology change where the technology itself is accessible should not result in intense global competition. And then lastly, transnational uh, challenges and we always used to talk about famine and floods and things like that. Now it's climate change, which of course is at the root cause of those things. But climate change is very high, obviously, on the agenda of transnational challenges. So as we move to look at the baseline, and we'll do that from a threat analysis point of view. So Russia continues to pose the greatest nuclear, conventional military and sub-threshold threat to European security. That's in black and white in the documents. China uh, poses a complex systemic challenge and its military modernization and its growing international uh, assertiveness will certainly pose a challenge. Iran and uh, North Korea continue to threaten global stability. And then there is the need to counter a range of disruptive states and non-state threats. And amongst those, of course, is cyber and advanced weapons even, where because this technology is accessible to many others. And then climate change and biodiversity um, will the losses that result from that will, could create instability and competition for resources. And then there's the new domains of cyberspace and space. And there's threat there and there is competition and there is the problem over gaining international agreement over the use and behaviors in space, which is pretty limited. And you know, there's some moral and ethical standards to be applied there alongside regulation. That's a really difficult aspect. And in defense doctrine for what the last two, three years, it's been an identified problem, this competition for the global commons as they're known then. So this is space, cyberspace. It's the Arctic, it's the oceans. And so th this is going to be, is going to ramp up in importance as time goes on. And then uh, this leads us to worry that the rules-based international aerospace, uh, sorry, the rules-based international order is under threat. And that's a fundamental aspect actually of the success of aerospace 
because we've had an understanding on common certification and in aviation um, in terms of access to airspace and common safety standards. So without these sorts of well-policed international orders, then these things tend to be under threat. So these are the things that have to be taken into account when determining grand strategy and indeed the military strategy that follows. So if we go to the top left, then um, the um, relationship with the US, if you, you know, as you read through the documents, you get um, the correct and distinct impression that um, partnership with the US is actually a major objective. And secondly, the um, much vaunted saying of being the European cornerstone of NATO uh, is also very present, very paramount. Um, increasingly, there is um, prominence given to what's known as the Five Eyes Agreement. Many of you will be familiar, the intelligence agreement between, us, um, between the US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand and the UK. And in an age where intelligence is at an absolute premium and very complex to analyze, that of course is very important. But US and NATO still seen as the most important bedrock. Then China. China is a competitor, China is a partner. And it was carefully nuanced. I mean, the, the, the language about Russia was stark. Uh, the language about China is uh, much more heavily nuanced. It is um, a recognition that um, in spite of China's uh, seeming intent to build its armed forces, etc., it's also an important economic player. It will have the largest economy in the G7 within a couple of years. And so um, making China um, stand on the naughty step alongside uh, Russia um, is not seen as an intelligent move at this stage and I fully understand why. I mean for the UK though, you know, China and the problem in, that's gradually developing in Hong Kong is not going to make that easy to manage but nevertheless I think um, we're handling China with kid gloves in this review. And then the UK's tilt bottom left there to the Indo-Pacific um, is based on um, economic reasons because uh, the Indo-Pacific is the world's economic growth engine now. Um, it, um, uh, the E7, as we say, in the Eastern Hemisphere um, has just about uh, surpassed the G7. The, is, COVID has made some more um, alterations, but you know, pretty much uh, they're on a par. Uh, secondly, in terms of security, and in this case, it's particularly to preserve freedom of navigation in a region which is in, you know, enjoying intense, uh, intensifying geopolitical competition and generating potential flashpoints, none more so than the South China Sea. Values is the other thing to promote open societies and uphold these international rules and norms. And, and for many years, the last decade, our approach to China was one of containment through uh, embracing them and assuming that by embracing them, they would come to accept the importance and significance of um, international norms and values. And then um, the aim, I suppose, is uh, clearly to deepen relationships in the Indo-Pacific regions and a route to do that is what's known as the Quad and the Quad flags are shown there, Japan, India, Australia and the US, which is, it's not an alliance, it's um, a, um, a dialogue, it's as simple as that I suppose. Um, amongst that, um, other European nations obviously have the same view and France, for example, uh, is um, mounting a naval exercise with Quad partners known as Quad Plus One coming up very shortly. I think beyond that, there is no strategy yet from the Foreign Office on how uh, this is going to be approached, but uh, we will um, undoubtedly expect things like the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which US is working on trade agreement, 
with the region to become important and the ASEAN dialogue um, become an ASEAN dialogue partner and they're all small states from Malaysia through Singapore um, in that region who are nevertheless very important all with burgeoning economies. Um, as for military strategy, if we go to top right, then uh, to me this was the big surprise. Um, having agreed an ongoing reduction in nuclear warheads down to two, uh, two, from 220 to 180 by the middle of this decade, um, then the decision has been taken to increase the um, nuclear warheads to 260. And I do remember reading a commentary in the newspapers um, about a month before this and uh, an MOD, MOD source allegedly said there will be some eye-popping conclusions. Well, I think this is one of them. Uh, the review says um, a minimal, credible, independent nuclear deterrent assigned to the defense of NATO remains essential in order to guarantee our security and that of our allies in recognition of the evolving security environment, including the developing range of technological and doctrinal threats. The first two, or uh, well, the first half of that has been in every review I can remember. The second half though, talking about evolving security environment, developing range of technological and doctrinal threats is new. It plays inside nuclear theology by creating uncertainty and that of course um, is exactly what you want to do with a deterrent but that in itself was a surprise. Uh, below that then uh, the man with his fingers picking out the numbers the grey zone and that's at the other end of the spectrum. Um, the grey zone is now reality no doubt about it with um, sub threshold interventions which are very difficult to attribute very hard to deter therefore and they range from the dissemination of fake news to the badge list application of low-level military violence such as we saw in the Salisbury poisonings. Disruption, disinformation and deception all achieved through a wider variety of instruments, stuff we hadn't really considered being in the military lexicon in the past but uh, that means that in response the term military capability takes on a whole new meaning, a new breadth and uh, in the suite of documents concerned here the reality of full spectrum capability also rightly includes the space and cyber domains but in short the battle space has become um, much more elastic and the way to address that has to be uh, much more wide ranging. And then finally the bottom right which I think is interesting, this is my uh, my own analysis, um, does this e actually represent a movement towards a dominant maritime strategy? I rather think it does and uh, because when you take this together, when you look at those strategic imperatives, it's a big change from the days when east of Suez was um, an unknown world, I mean pretty much since 1966. Uh, so um, a certainly a different world and the documents um, take account of that and in my view uh, give a pretty good analysis of it. On to um, things that um, will be absolutely important to you at Boscombe Down. Now this is not a homily to the tornado, uh, it's merely I'm going to use some personal experience to illustrate my points but here are the headlines of the science technology and my words operational sovereignty and uh, I'll explain the significance of that in a moment but um, there is an absolute assess, uh, acceptance that um, there is systemic competition in critical and emerging novel technologies and we've got to do something about it because they're being applied to our detriment and that's always a good thing to read in a review. Um, and therefore, and this to me is uh, one of the most important statements that uh, this nation will seek to gain strategic advantage by taking a whole of UK approach to the science and technology ecosystem. This has been a continue cons continued concern to those of us in the defence industry over a number of decades that 
there was no holistic approach to the sort of research that was going on in universities, the sort of research that was going on in small companies, startups, etc., the labs of large companies, etc. And the recognition that the S&T ecosystem won't exist in and of itself without the stimulation of funding and without the stimulation of research programs. And uh, it is therefore very reassuring to see an understanding of this. And I know this was something Dominic Cummings felt um, quite passionate about. So that is a good thing. Um, the next point about um, R&D investment of 2.4% of GDP by 2027, they're playing fast and loose with the Frascati principles there about how you define S&T and R&D, but we'll leave that aside. Um, the number's old, but actually um, it's solely government investment in this review. Um, again, uh, unless you're fueling the R&T, R&D, S&T ecosystem, then you can't expect it to exist. And uh, there's a bit of a question mark running around uh, in government or in um, Westminster and Whitehall, not necessarily in government, about the reality of the funding here, because there's quite a lot of shifts of the tectonic plates related to Brexit in that um, our, um, our right of access to Horizon 2020, which is the five year tranche of EU research programmes, um, was secured on the basis of our paying an additional fee of 120 billion euro. Um, and that's got to come from somewhere and the way budgets are uh, moving around between departments so has left the UKRI who oversee all this sort of thing feeling a tad exposed and we'll see that played out in the coming weeks. Um, as for um, MOD, um, a guarantee of 6.6 .6 billion of R&D and experimentation expenditure on uh, R&D and experimentation over the next four years. And that's driven by the Defence Technology Strategy, which was published back in the autumn of 2020. Particularly good volume, quite slim, but um, full of good sense. And with five priorities, and they are full spectrum multi-domain ISR, amen to that, as you'll see. Multi-domain command and control communications and computers, C4. Secure and sustained advantage of sub-threshold capabilities. Asymmetric hard power and freedom of access and maneuver. That's quite a revolutionary package actually, but that's, um, that's what it was, um, uh, that's what it articulates and that's what the money will go towards. And it'll do that, um, uh, by in surely embracing a responsible, the words are beautiful, a responsible and democratic approach to cyber capability. Um, and that's again, you know, almost part of um, non-nuclear deterrence, keeping people guessing about the extent to which you will use offensive cyber capability. Um, also, um, investment and regulation aimed at driving innovation and getting uh, nascent technology across the valley of death. You know, this is from the point of where, yeah, you've got sort of a, uh, a working basic prototype uh, uh, on your university bench and then getting it into a prototype that you can test in operational circumstances and field in a piece of defense equipment. And that has been um, a very difficult area uh, as of, since the beginning of advanced technology because getting it across Getting technology across the valley of death takes a large amount of money and small firms who often create this technology are incapable of doing that. But that's why the Defence Growth Partnership was formed and the Defence Solutions Centre uh, Joint Government Industry Partnership. And then there's to be 800 million for an advanced research and invention agency. Uh, again, that was something Dominic Cummings felt passionate about. Um, I, you know, we could say, yeah, that look, it's meant to look like DARPA. Um, it would be good if it could, but um, it nevertheless is a, um, a good step forward. And wrapping around that and the value of death investment, etc., is the understanding and acceptance that on some occasions you're probably going to fail. Whereas that's been an anathema in um, 
the use of public money hitherto. A defense center for artificial intelligence. I think we've got to ask ourselves is, okay, that's very useful and um, has a certain ring about it, but is there enough expertise, both human and intellectual in artificial intelligence and machine learning to make an individual center sensible or does that represent stovepiping? And the, you know, the jury's out on that, but that having done um, some research on all of this in the past, I, you know, it's one of the questions in my mind. But the biggie, the most important thing to industry and the supply chains that feed it, is this recognition that uh, there are some areas where there needs to be the, pre the preservation of end-to-end -end capability in industry. And by that, we mean the ability to design, to develop, to integrate, test, evaluate, update, upgrade, and assure such systems on shore and that's why i got a picture of a tornado with a couple of weapons on because we'll have a look at that in detail in terms of why does that matter it matters because to be a nation with a strategic defense industrial base who is able to meet the requirement of full spectrum capability and do it quickly you need this stuff called the body of knowledge and the body of knowledge is what you generate in the defense enterprise right across the piece industry armed forces civil service labs everywhere that provides you with the ability to do certain stuff and it has three dimensions i describe it this way it has a sort of vertical dimension which allows you to have the understanding of how to use your weapon systems, your defense equipment and your capabilities even as far as cyber in a situation where you want to frustrate an enemy. And that um, provides you with ability to command and control, but also behind that is the political, legal and ethical aspects of, well, um, can I really explain and understand what this particular technology, what this weapon system does? So assurance of that is very important. And that's why I put up Storm Shadow and the Raptor Pod from my history in 2003. Both of those were nascent capabilities and Storm Shadow in particular had to convince the Secretary of State that A, we could use it safely as far as uh, our own aircraft and release to service was concerned and B, that in my targeting directive it could be embraced because we understood exactly what it did and how it did it. And uh, that was thanks to spending uh, a lot of hours at MBDA at Stevenage and a fair few down at Boscombe Down where you are and doubtless as someone listening who was involved in that program. Same was true of the Raptor Pod, which um, was a, um, at the time, a very advanced photo recce pod, uh, which provided the sort of imagery that we had no other capability for. Both of those weapons were unique in the uh, coalition. The US did not have a weapon like Storm Shadow and they didn't have a recce pod as good as Raptor. So that sort of assurance uh, is important. It also links Foxhole to laboratory and, you know, this is the Formula One uh, equivalent, I suppose, where in practice in Formula One cars, they um, analyze the performance against the software, amend the software, download it by satellite and you're off again. And um, so this is the ability to change very quickly software and systems which are being used in combat. And then uh, never forget that today's R&D is tomorrow's capability. And I well remember uh, Prime Minister Cameron talking um, eagerly about the quality of UK defence uh, equipment that was being used in Libya at the time, including um, attack submarines. And uh, one of my colleagues was brave enough to say, actually, none of that equipment was bought off the shelf. That was all the investment of national and industries R&D pounds in the period a couple of decades ago. And that's true. So the body of knowledge is really important. It's also important for urgent operational requirements. And again, is bread and butter to you at Boscombe. 
because that's what you find yourself doing whenever we send uh, aircraft into operations, sometimes um, small things, sometimes very big things. Um, in the case of the Iraq war, there are 192 um, UORs required. A third was just building up stocks like uh, desert combat gear, etc. A third was stuff that was already in the program but needed accelerating and Storm Shadow and Raptor were those among those. And the third was stuff we'd never even heard of or thought of. And um, amongst that was some special forces stuff. The other aspect is it's the basis of your testing and evaluation and indeed your um, um, modeling and simulation. And the um, uh, gets quite, uh, those two things get quite a lot of exposure in the review. Um, a, because there's a recognition that um, both of those things are going to be wrapped in artificial intelligence and uh, AI systems and the sort of platforms you're going to be looking at in the future will be riven with non-deterministic software. Um, in other words, it's not written in code, it generates itself as it goes along and so you need uh, to have the capability to um, ensure that you can assure that. And the, um, the review uh, in the industrial strategy part makes that clear. It says government has access to unique data sets, niche scientific expertise and specialist test and evaluation facilities which are not otherwise available to our external partners and are often essential to push the boundaries of what is possible within the extreme operating environments of sea, land, cyber and space. Never read anything like that in a government review before. Um, I should say that um, uh, the body of knowledge is what um, allows your industry to undertake what we call noble work, which is back to first principles of design, develop, integrate, etc. And without that, um, you may or may not be able to be an intelligent customer. And without it at all, then you're very badly placed. You know, you're in the caveat emptor uh, classification. Um, of course, spiral development and integration, really knowing the systems, having access to the basic codes, etc., is um, an obvious point. Uh, the review was a bit, a bit naughty, um, is the kindest thing I can say, um, in clumping together integration and complex manufacturing and um, sticking the F-35B in the next phrase in the sentence. It's true for advanced manufacturing, it's not true for integration in the sense that the review was talking about it anyway. And at the bottom line is it matters because here is a recognition by government there of the strategic nature of the defence industrial base. And um, again, um, that has been something which has never been explicitly stated in quite that way. So when we can go on to look at the ORBAT, and I'm not going to um, dwell on uh, the whole of the Integrated Force 2030, as it's now called. Students of this will remember Joint Force 2020 and then Joint Force 2025. Well, now we've got Integrated Force 2030. The point is it's beyond joint. You know, it really is integrated. The, the sort of digital backbone that threads it all together makes it absolutely integrated. So, um, in terms of a few of the headlines in this, um, then Typhoon, a bit of old news where it sort of regurgitates the fact that it will get radar to the ESA radar. I could as a cynic of part of the company that produced it say it's about seven years late. Um, had we had it um, seven years before, we could have exported Typhoon more extensively. Um, but nevertheless, it's hugely capable sensor, um, you know, beyond anything that uh, you would think a mechanically, well, a mechanically scanned radar could do. Electronic attack, communications down the beam, as well as um, multimodal operation. Uh, some weapons upgrade, of course, Typhoon, very successful uh, in terms of Project Centurion, which you were all engaged in and uh, the additional weapon of Spearcat 3, which um, is a 
significant development of brimstone as an anti-armor weapon. Um, really impressive piece of technology. Um, the thing we were expecting um, was some clarity uh, or something on F-35B numbers. And um, I quote there verbatim the text, grow the Lightning II fleet beyond the 48 aircraft already ordered. Um, pretty coy, really. We kind of expected uh, at least a stab at where we were headed. Um, it is um, true to say that um, uh, a number of senior Royal Naval officers uh, have given lectures on the record where they've talked about a probable 60 to 80 ultimate number. Um, if you talk to um, a um, defence politician, they would say, well, that's a matter for um, the review that we will do in 2025. Um, they might also say, and also we want to see how good um, what happens to Tempest and FCAS, um, <clears throat> which is convenient. But um, the, um, I'm going to talk a bit more about uh, Tempest uh, in a moment, but a strategic investment of two billion over the next four years is a good thing, undoubtedly. And uh, of course, FCAS is a systems of system of systems. And so it's not only the platform, a major sixth gen fighter type platform, but it's also uh, embraces the concept of the loyal wingman, the light, affordable, novel combat aircraft or Lanka, for which um, a capability demonstration program has been lit and also embracing the concept of swarming drones. So it's an important aspect when we're talking about uh, the world beyond 2030 and into 2040s. Um, and then on the rotary side, um, often rotary is neglected from a strategic point of view and from an industrial strategy point of view. This review is different. It doesn't do that. It mentions that um, uh, the um, AH-64E, the new version of the Apache, uh, which is being built offshore, incidentally, by Boeing. Um, uh, I think four are in the country now, but in any event, um, uh, the deliveries will be complete by 2025. That's a wholesale different airplane than the WAH-1. And then a new medium lift helicopter in the mid-2020s to replace Puma. And, um, you know, that's pointing uh, in the industrial strategy through a strategic partnership with Leonardo Helicopters at Yeovil. And then the next generation of helicopters, which NATO is just um, developing its spec for and the US Army is developing a spec for, which takes us into advanced technologies and potentially manned, unmanned, etc. But let's just dwell for a moment on Tempest because um, it is um, a very important program um, and it's it's quite different actually and, and becoming more obviously different than the equivalent that is um, being put together in mainland Europe by um, Airbus and Dassault. In this case it's gone out to be affordable, flexible, upgradable and exportable and a fast time to market. And it's quite interesting and I really recommend if you can the branch gets a separate lecture on this because it just is an amazing transformation of how to build a fighter airplane. But um, Italy and Sweden were signed up as international partners. Um, the interesting thing is technology and capabilities being pulled in from way, way beyond the defence sector. And with that sort of expertise all coming together, it's possible to evaluate technology in weeks, which traditionally would have taken years. And some of the headlights there, city's worth of data in a second, I think it's a great throwaway line. Um, no dials in the cockpit, thank you. Augmented virtual reality. Um, option, manned or unmanned, doesn't matter. Swarming drones we've mentioned, modern weapons, directed energy weapons in particular. But the interesting stuff, is the bottom bit um, in terms of the impact on uh, the industrial base and manufacturing um, technology and the techniques that are being used to reduce the schedule time and cost because time to market is the really important thing 
and it's got to be um, uh, incredibly um, competitive, so getting the cost down. Um, absolutely leading edge use of agile and integrated manufacturing, uh, which is uh, some of you will have heard of um, Industry 4.0. A lot of that uh, is embraced in, in that vision of how manufacturing should go. Uh, this is a manifestation of it. And interestingly, quite a lot of lessons learned by BA Systems through the manufacture of the rear empennage for the F-35B in terms of um, the, the integrated methods of machining, etc. And then model-based design, in other words, um, put simply, um, you do the entire um, design, develop, integrate, test potentially um, part of the life cycle virtually. You create an enormous amount of data along the way. So the whole uh, airplane has a digital backbone from the minute you press the first key right the way till it goes out of service. That's fundamentally important. That's the way civil aircraft manufacturing is going as well. But model-based design, model-based engineering is the thing of the future. And that, of course, um, leads, as we know, to the um, concept of the digital twin. And uh, it will only be a matter of time before any new complex system of systems will be manufactured in that way. It's a really impressive piece of transformation. Um, something slightly less impressive to me is the footprint um, of ISR, but this is the rest of um, what's in that Integrated Force 2030. And I've just popped the numbers up there uh, because um, in each case, the numbers are small and um, that is a worry. So if I just start with the Wedgetail E7A, um, um, operated um, also by the Royal Australian Air Force, uh, the requirement was five um, to replace the five E3Ds, um, which has been reduced to three uh, with a two year gap. The E3Ds coming out of service this year, the Wedgetail um, won't come in until 2023. Um, you know, that um, for a fundamental platform that provides your um, airborne uh, com air command and control, that's a worry. Um, we've always been worried about only nine P8 Poseidons, and uh, I know uh, Air Marshal Andy Roberts is uh, on the call here, and uh, as an ex-DAL plans, I would expect no less, but he wrote a very erudite paper for the House Commons Defence Committee proving incontroversially that to do the um, necessary roles that would be required at a rate that would be required in a conflict situation you actually need 16 not 9 and uh, of course that was close to the number we were originally going to get when that was the Nimrod MRA4 and then the protector has come down from 20 to 16 and so um, that is a worrying uh, state of affairs for ISR. Um, now <coughs> You can look at this in a number of ways. I think if I was worrying about Ukraine right now, I'd want as much ISR as I could possibly get over that region. Um, if I was also still worrying about Syria, I'd want as much ISR as I could get over that region too. And when you only have small platforms, it really brings home that small numbers of platforms, that one platform can only be in one place at one time. Um, the um, answer probably uh, in a level of security not exposable in the review is the aspiration to have an ISR satellite constellation there in the space sector. And space comes out really well in this review and it's realistic and um, it's given a good deal of momentum. So there's to be an integrated civil military uh, space strategy. And I can tell you my space colleagues in the society have been um, very concerned that uh, the UK space strategy has still not been formulated. Hopefully this will give it a boost and we'll get it soon. Skynet 6, that's 5 billion over 10 years. That's good for the space industry and its supply chains. The establishment of a space command sends a strong message. Uh, there's to be a National Space Ops Centre. I thought we already have one at High Wycombe. I'm sure I remember sitting in there when I was Commander-in-Chief, but still. 
um, and the ISR satellite constellation a space academy to train people again it goes back to my point about suitably qualified and experienced people an onshore satellite launch capability by 2022 and I would um, uh, I would venture to suggest that will be the facility that's being rapidly developed by Highlands and Highlands Enterprise Board up in the north of Scotland and then what's coming out Typhoon Tranche 1 um, try, Tranche 1 had a very um, low grade um, internal mission and um, mission computer uh, and it was also a tribute to excessive subsystem integration which um, the design of the original uh, work share agreement was um, also welded into the design of the architecture of the aircraft where tranche 2 with its crypt computer and onwards um, is not like that so yeah the tranche ones are um, so inflexible now that they're um, they need to go hawk t1 um, question mark red arrows they've got enough t1 to keep going ba146 due to come out of service anyway the sf c130s the sf are smarting about that and uh, we'll worry about the extent they can get what they need out of the a400m and then e3ds um, and then sentinel has gone uh, sentinel was um, scheduled to go in the previous uh, review 2015 um, at a period around now uh, but you know when you when you look at back at those ISR numbers and just remembering one of those can only be in one place at one time that's what worries me and then industrial strategy I'm getting close to the end now um, I um, having been the vice president defense and ADS when I was working for Leonardo and having to track government's approaches to matters industry uh, I'm reasonably impressed by the industrial strategy paper um, because one it recognizes that there needs to be a sustainable defense industrial base for both security and economic reasons and uh, somewhere it uh, it mentions that uh, it's the most highly um, significant and profitable element of our manufacturing capability but the thing that always worried me before was the lack of understanding about the body of knowledge when talking about um, operational sovereignty and I still prefer the word operational or the words operational sovereignty but this um, moves much nearer to uh, the reality of what I want to look at or what I wanted to see rather um, in terms of elucidating a concept of strategic imperatives and areas where we need operational independence and the strategic um, imperatives are pretty self-explanatory nuclear deterrence um, and all the capabilities that sit around it submarines cryptography and offensive cyber um, and on the grounds that there are no safe credible and or legal ways to meet our security needs otherwise and then there's a range of capabilities and it is a big range requiring operational independence and it runs through a number of subsets of capability from complex weapons through shipbuilding through combat air rotary and space and each um, will require its own sub strategy as it were shipbuilding's got it combat air has already got it but the others haven't and um, again you know puts across the notion that we need independence on those things um, and uh, hurrah to that the other aspect which um, is important is the matter of the definition of value for money the 2012 white paper defense and security through technology um, at a footnote had a definition of value for money which I'm going to read to you uh, value for money is the optimal combination of time cost and effectiveness within available resources it's a relative complex concept which involves the comparison of potential and actual outcomes of different procurement options okay value for money for each program is determined on a case-by-case -case basis depending on the circumstances okay non-quantifiable factors may be relevant to value for money assessments 
such as the supplier's track record and financial robustness. The MOD does not consider wider employment, industrial or economic factors in its value for money assessments. Um, I regard that as a toxic definition. The value for money descriptions that we see in 2021 are much nearer the mark. They recognize the gross value add when you are contracting a UK company, whether it be BA Systems, Leonardo at Yeovil, on the economies in their area and the economies in their supply chain. And <clears throat> so uh, the 2021 version talks about social value and 10% of the marks in an acquisition um, contest are for social value. And it um, explicitly states that the replacement of global competition by default with a more flexible and nuanced approach, unquote, admitted um, uh, it, and it underpins the fact that um, around that same uh, area in the reports, it says one of the most successful and innovative sectors of the British economy, talking about the defence industrial base. So um, some uh, useful stuff as well. Um, lots of um, accent on national and international strategic partnering in the case of uh, helicopters where uh, Augusta Westland as it was, Leonardo Helicopters now, has had a strategic partnering arrangement since 2006 and uh, we always felt uh, Mondays and Thursdays we're partnering and Tuesdays, Wednesdays and Fridays we seem to be competing so it was all a bit schizophrenic but I think we've got the message now. Um, there's a lot of support elucidated for exports and recognising the significance of the Team UK approach in other words government to government arrangements and government support, significant government support for export campaigns. And then a few of the things that make your life difficult as an industrialist, the single source contract regulations were a nightmare. Again, I was the ADS VP Defence when they came in and they were hard work to get into a form that we could even understand and mind use. So a simplification there and bear in mind in this sort of strategy, probably quite a lot more will be single source. And then uh, revised terms and conditions of service, uh, particularly uh, of trade rather. Um, particularly those affecting SMEs actually, because um, in most uh, contracts direct with MOD, you have to take or had to take unlimited liability, uh, which for a, a, a major prime, you can back that off, uh, but not as an SME. And so that has gone. And also a much uh, better way of managing intellectual property and recognizes who is the owner, who has unfettered access. Um, all that will take a significant culture change, I think on both sides of the fence, but particularly I think on the public sector, both in the Treasury, MOD, DNS, etc. And the question mark then remains, um, are there enough suitably qualified and experienced people? And when we look at all that, the whole thing through the lens of the society, these are our three primary concerns. I haven't mentioned the climate change brochure, but it's a pretty good read actually, and I, uh, I admire um, the, um, the way it's been put together. But um, in there, in the climate change part, it talks um, about um, the MOD placing significant en um, emphasis on novel propulsion and synthetic fuels. So, uh, you know, areas of particular applicability to civil aviation as well. Um, and of course, in the old days, so much of defence research drove civil research. So maybe um, we're seeing a bit of a renaissance there. That will be a very good thing. Um, the RAF has also joined the Jet Zero Council, which is the uh, Prime Minister's um, council that he's invoked to produce the first uh, zero carbon aeroplane in the 2030s. Future flight, of course, is very well served by Team Tent Tempest and the energy now being applied to the military use of space, for example. And on tomorrow's professionals, not readily understood, but in the, in the defence enterprise, and by that I mean the armed services, the civil service, um, 
that ecosystem includes 55,000 technicians and engineers and they will be confronted with some of the most leading edge technology, most interesting integration, most interesting platforms that are imaginable and they'll be at the cutting edge of science a lot of the time. So that will act as a huge draw, I hope into the engineering profession, the aerospace engineering profession. And um, whichever way you cut it, the outflow from the armed forces and from defense's own engineers into the civilian economy is a good thing. It, ultimately, it's a national resource of huge value. And um, this review um, it does recognize that. So, the relevant, the, the three questions, sorry, four questions and the relevance test. Uh, is the strategic focus in our defense and security posture? Yes, I think there is. Is the stability of intent over its delivery? I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure how um, a government interest in the light of difficult economic circumstances will sustain to the next election. I'm not so sure that the parcel will be um, effectively passed into a future government. It makes sense and it should do, but that's never been a uh, particular watchword for uh, for politics. Is it affordable? Tricky question. 16 billion um, settlement before all this came up on the streets was very welcome, um, but um, many of you will know there is um, a big economy drive going on in the MOD to create some headroom to deliver all this. Um, so some, some of the programs that are, are elucidated uh, in the report with their numbers by them uh, are in pretty good shape, but there's some other stuff that isn't mentioned. So there is a question mark over affordability and I think there's an even bigger question mark over whether there's enough for the right people to make it all happen because it's, um, it's a pretty big um, strategic move. And um, I always apply the relevance test to these things um, and I do that for platforms capability or a review of this nature. And I say, well, is it operationally relevant? Does it fit the threat as we see it? Uh, well, yes, this one does. Is it economically relevant? In other words, um, is it going to cost far too much money? And um, reviews in the past have been very light on an accurate assessment of how much it all costs. Is it sensibly affordable within the construct of where we see the national economy? I would say just. I don't think there's much room for maneuver. Is it industrially relevant? Yes, for sure. Is it politically relevant? Not sure. Not sure about this passing the parcel bit um, because um, there are uh, different views, for example, about how we should handle China, how we should handle Russia, and uh, indeed um, our relationship even with the US. So uh, the politics of this in this more dynamic um, political environment in which we now live, I think is an open question. But you can ask me that question now, uh, should you so wish. Great, thank you very much, uh, Brian. That was a really interesting lecture and uh, definitely uh, a great uh, analysis of the uh, defence review. Um, I believe we've actually got Nick Lay, our, our branch president, uh, has, has managed to join the call. So uh, I'll hand over to him to go through the Q&A process and, uh, and uh, yeah, take proceedings from there. Good evening. I hope you can you can hear me. Um, um, I'm seeing some slight freezing on the screen, but if I'm able to, I'd very much like to uh, thank Sir Brian for a really erudite view of the defence papers and uh, invite questions uh, through the chat as we have been doing on these occasions. But um, I thought one of the fascinating elements uh, of your um, analysis, Sir Brian, was around Air I Star. Uh, and particularly uh, given um, the focus on national capability on, on combat air and helicopters, there is much less of uh, uh, an, an assessment of ISAR other than the space domain. Do you see there being significant um, uh, limitations to our, uh, to our abilities in ISR as a result of that? Yes, I mean, we only know what we know. Um, and to give you an example, when 
Options for Change was published a very long time ago. Tom King was the Secretary of State for Defence and he stood up in the House and said, uh, the most important aspect of our defence capability is the nuclear deterrent and the means by which it is deployed and protected. And so, um, and he then went on to mention the importance of the Nimrod, for example. Now, um, I say we only know what we know because um, I don't know the extent to which technology has taken um, undersea detection in different directions. Um, and this could be um, a facet which affects other parts of the I-star spectrum. But I think there is um, a lot was learned uh, by the Rapid Capability Office in Air Command um, over a small program they did with small satellites about um, developing a constellation of ISR satellites. But um, frequently um, in, in every operation since the end of the Cold War, we have wanted more ISR. So, uh, you know, I think that's a, I think that's a problem. Mm. Thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm just like looking at the Q&A, but unfortunately I've got the rotating um, circle of death. So, Jack, I was wondering if you could have a look and see if there's anything come up in our Q&A as to whether we've got any other questions from the audience tonight. No problem. So uh, we'll start off with uh, Mike B, who uh, has asked a question about what about peacekeeping operations that aren't a threat but often fall into the military? Yeah, that, I mean, that will inevitably um, um, continue to be likely employment. And it's, um, I think we've gone beyond the knee-jerk reaction that we used to get of something must be done based on what people are seeing on rolling news. But nevertheless, as a member of the permanent five of the Security Council, um, you're under the, uh, the spotlight, particularly if uh, to, there is a problem in a region which you have historical links, either colonial or otherwise. Um, equally, um, our European partners um, regard that as an important aspect of our collective endeavour from um, the um, uh, ever since the really the difficult days of Bosnia and they realised the significance of getting involved and sorting things out early if at all possible. And then uh, lastly, interestingly, even China regards uh, peacekeeping as important. Great, thank you very much. Um, so on, on that topic actually, uh, Willard Strandberg, the uh, um, Washington DC branch of the Royal Air Society asks, uh, given the Chinese push to dominate technology development, uh, trade in other world countries, Africa, South America, and mili um, the military in Asia and Southeast Asia, at what point does the UK government recognise the relationship with China is moving to an adversarial, adversarial footing? France and Germany appear to be interested only in the economic how much can I sell approach. Yes, good question. The, um, uh, you can't separate out the, um, uh, the pros and cons of a relationship with China. Um, if um, if you look at the Belt and Road approach and um, you see the huge amount of, uh, of finance that China is pouring into, and I, I've been into two particular areas where the projects exist, one in Sri Lanka and one in Pakistan, and vast amounts of money. Now that does not come without strings and uh, the Belt and Road is there to link up um, what in naval base terms would be known as a string of pearls. So I think um, there is a recognition that, um, and I'll choose my words carefully, I think there is already a difference of opinion within government uh, and we're seeing some of that played out in the media, but um, I'm thinking more of official level between, you know, um, A, where really is the balance of our interests when it comes to China and that's why Hong Kong is so important because it rather obviously has to skew our view um, and how will we know and how will we agree amongst ourselves when we've reached the point that um, this is a problem and if you go back to the 5G debacle then um, and that's quoted in um, one of the documents um, that just shows you how difficult it is. 
Absolutely, no, uh, thank you very much for that. Um, got a question here from uh, Keith Dennison, uh, who asked, uh, you suggested that a dominant maritime strategy might be the appropriate response to the current geopolitical shifts. Do you think that the IR and Associated Paper position the UK uh, position the UK to adopt such a strategy on its own, or would such a strategy only be credible and effective given an alignment, an alignment of NATO and the five powers on such a dominant strategy? Is such alignment likely? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, um, if I was writing it, uh, I would not have, um, <clears throat> I'd have been much more careful about making it look like a change in strategy, and I was educated by the Royal Navy at Greenwich. Um, so, um, but uh, my analysis is that that's what it's saying. I think that uh, that is not plausible um, in the sense of achieving effect rather than simply presence without being tied into alliances with others. And I don't think, I think we're going to have a tough time getting NATO um, to look beyond its near abroad. Uh, we're going to have a tough enough time getting them interested in the Middle East. Um, but my point is, you know, it, it is things like the Quad, it is solidifying the relationships and heaven knows we've had a naval relationship with Japan uh, going back 100, uh, more than 100 years now. Um, and uh, likewise with Australia um, and with the US and actually historically before um, before about 1970 with India as well. So, you know, there is, um, uh, there are a number of naval powers there whose um, combined effect um, would be uh, important in the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, but I, I don't think um, the UK could realistically say, here's our maritime strategy and we are in a position to keep um, uh, access open through choke points or in the South China Sea on our own and you know the the review doesn't say that but um, that's what you normally think of when you say the UK has adopted a maritime strategy. Absolutely yeah thank you very much. Um, we've got another question here from uh, Willard Strandberg um, which I think is quite a popular one actually. Uh, what will be the impact of Brexit on the ability of UK development and industrial air and space programs within the EU? Quite a big question there. Yeah, um, let's start with the easy bit. Um, in terms of um, the way in which the UK, I mean, defense, the defense industrial base is driven by its sole customer, which is the Ministry of Defense. So um, hitherto, there are not huge differences between pre and post Brexit. And, you know, I work for Leonardo and we um, recognize that when we built a radar for Typhoon, um, bits of it crossed the international borders 30 times. And uh, so, you know, that gives you a headache to start with. But actually, it's seemingly uh, still working reasonably well. I think in terms of um, competitiveness and operational sovereignty, then um, UK governments are seeing uh, the future sensibly as being the UK has got to be prepared, as I listed in a number of cases, of maintaining independence. And uh, that, to my mind, is very sensible. The area that does concern most of us is um, research, uh, broader research, blue skies research, the sort of thing that Horizon 2020 was doing, um, and also the people who are top rate researchers in Europe and the worry about visas, which is now beginning to be relaxed again, and the concern about access to programs within Europe uh, was a problem that now is being sorted. But in many ways, it's too early to say in terms of how well those aspects are working. But I think, you know, when it comes to strategy and intent, the government have got the message that we need more independence on shore and amen to that. Yeah, definitely. Thank you very much. And I think we've got probably time for one more question. So uh, I will ask that of uh, Carla Reid. The UK's non-state enemies employ a uh, employ an ever-growing, diverse and unregulated set of information tools and weapons to inf influence attitudes, beliefs and behaviours. Their rule 
free, true to agile approach requires zero testing, rules or regulation. We're often playing catch up. Um, our process and relatively so R&D processes take a while to implement, reducing strategic effect. Our advisories have already moved on. Requirements have often change. Uh, with that in mind, how do you suggest we get, get ahead of the game uh, in terms of, um, yeah, uh, standing still, our research and development process being quite slow to implement and that sort of thing? Yeah, I, um, I was asked this question in Pakistan and I said more AI and more machine learning. And uh, that is, uh, you know, they all laughed, but that's absolutely the answer. Um, because you, the only way you can speed up the necessary accreditation and certification of complex systems of systems is to get yourself away from having to build them as, as prototypes and then test them as hard platforms. Uh, so model-based engineering, the digital twin, um, all run by AI using machine learning it is the answer. And um, that's what we're seeing a bit of in Tempest already. Absolutely, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you everyone for asking questions. Sorry we didn't get time to uh, quite ask, uh, ask all of them. Um, we'll pass some of those that weren't asked on to Brian to Brian afterwards um, and uh, we'll get back to you on those ones uh, but I just wanted to say uh, one more time thank you very much uh, to Brian Burridge for delivering uh, that really fascinating lecture today unfortunately Nick Lay has uh, messaged me to inform that he's had some uh, network issues and so uh, uh, can no longer hear the, uh, the meeting so unfortunately we're not going to be able to uh, get his closing thoughts but uh, I'll just uh, quickly summarize and uh, yeah so thank you very much indeed it was a really interesting lecture and I think hopefully everyone's got uh, a few uh, ideas and thoughts now about uh, our sort of future, the future outlook of uh, strategy and defence uh, in the UK. So uh, no, really interesting. And uh, thank you very much for closing out our lecture season. Uh, not at all. It was a pleasure. And my thanks to you and your branch committee for uh, laying on such a good uh, season of lectures this time. The branches are the lifeblood of the society and uh, they're a very important aspect of um, showing what the society does, that's nice, but actually more importantly, showing what aerospace and aviation is about. So well done to you and your committee, and thank you for all that your branch does. And with that, I'll say good night. Thank you very much, uh, that's a great uh, testament there. So thank you very much um, everybody for joining um, and, and throughout our entire lecture season, actually. It's been uh, certainly a challenging uh, season to get uh, our head around virtual lectures and uh, and yeah, uh, still get a, a relatively full lecture season in, but I think we've, we've managed okay and uh, we'll definitely take the learnings uh, forwards uh, into next season. So as I mentioned in the introduction, uh, we'll, uh, we'll go away now and uh, have a think about how we're going to do our lectures for next season. Uh, and then uh, if we, uh, once we've sort of uh, got an initial program, um, we'll uh, publish all the information on our website. So keep an eye out uh, throughout the summer and over the next few months uh, for uh, details of that. But uh, in the meantime, thank you very much again. Uh, we hope you all enjoyed uh, the lecture this evening. Um, stay safe and uh, yeah, we'll hope to see you all soon. Thanks very much. Bye.